Hello uh, everybody to our online talk of today uh, with the title Ask a Professor. Um, it's a pleasure to have all of you with us. Um, this is the last online talk of our uh, this year's online talk series in June and today is a very special talk. Uh, you will have the chance to uh, ask questions to professors, um, something that's yeah that's really a, sel uh, a seldom chance um, and I hope you, you use this opportunity to ask questions and learn more about your research opportunities in Germany. Um, I'm very uh, happy to have uh, three professors with us today um, and so thanks, thanks to all of you for, for sharing your um, yeah, information with us today. It's, it's a pleasure. Um, before I start, I, was, I would like to mention <clears throat> that this session is also recorded and sorry, um, <coughs> my apologies. Um, and um, I would like to um, yeah, present to you our panelists of today. Um, and I will do this in alphabetical order. And um, because of that, start with Professor Dr. Flores Ernst. Um, perhaps you could say also some words about you. Yes, thank you very much for the kind introduction. I hope you can hear me properly. Uh, I had some issues with my microphone lately, but I think it's all sorted out now. Um, yeah, my name is Lewis Ernst. I'm a professor for robotics with a focus on medical robotics at the University of Lübeck, in the very north of Germany, close to Hamburg on the shores of the Baltic Sea. I'm working at the Institute for Robotics and Cognitive Systems. And um, yeah, by design, I'm a mathematician. And I've graduated from Friedrich Alexander University in Erlangen in, in 2006. And I spent a year abroad doing my part of a master's degree, you could say a so-called postgraduate diploma in sciences at the University of Otago in Dunedin in New Zealand. Um, I also did my PhD here in Lübeck in signal processing and migrated towards robotics during that period. And uh, then left the university, worked at a company for engineering consulting and uh, helped in designing medical devices, medical products before coming back to the university in uh, 2014 where I was appointed a professor in 2017 and I've been here ever since. Um, also maybe of interest to you, I'm a member of the steering committee of Lübeck's Graduate School for Computing in Medicine and Life Sciences. So I, I work a lot with uh, PhD students and postdoctoral researchers from all over the world in this capacity. So thank you very much for the opportunity to be here and uh, yeah, I'd like to hand over to my next colleague. Yeah, thank you very much. Ni hao to China. And uh, I'm uh, Rainer Fink, I'm professor in physical chemistry, I'm an educated physicist and I graduated from the University of Constance and I did my postdoc in Uppsala University in Sweden uh, before I returned to Germany, Würzburg University, uh, to become professor in 2002 at Erlangen University, Friedrich Alexander University, Erlangen. I'm the uh, student dean uh, in the uh, in the programs um, in the undergraduate and graduate programs in chemistry and molecular science and uh, in addition uh, I'm the CEO of the Confucius Institute Erlangen Nuremberg so I have a strong relationship to China and uh, I uh, also have some guest professorships uh, in uh, Tongchi University and also at Sustec in Shenzhen. So I'm, uh, I'm, I have strong relations to China and uh, unfortunately we cannot travel to China right now, but I'm happy if the borders are back open uh, to return to my Chinese friends and colleagues. Um, uh, on the laptop and on the mm. on the microphone uh, in the tool, but um, I just wanted to say thank you and just um, yeah hand over to um, Professor Hilner. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, well, thank you for uh, the introduction. I'm Julia Hilner. 
I am um, I teach ancient history um, and I'm a professor at the um, Cluster of Excellence Beyond Slavery and Freedom at the University of Bonn and I think we're going to hear a little bit more about what a Cluster of Excellence is later on um, or oh, I can say something about it. Um, I was in uh, in the UK for 20 years from 2001 to 2021. I went there as a postdoc and then uh, my last position was as a professor of actually early medieval history at the University of Sheffield and I returned to Germany um, in about 2021, so I'm only here for nine months uh, in beautiful Bonn, uh, which is in the west of the country on the Rhine. Um, yeah, I think that's probably enough um, from me. Um, I think yeah, we probably want uh, to thank you so time. much, so much to all three of you um, for yeah for giving us some insights into your um, career and um, what you achieved. It's really impressive. It's a lot. Um, all of you, of course, have international experience, so also this will be interesting uh, for our participants. Um, and uh, all of you come from uh, different uh, research backgrounds. So we have uh, you from the humanities, from the national sciences, and the engineering uh, field of research. Um, so. Um, uh, yeah, this, this is important um, to the participants because sometimes the answers to your questions might differ according to the field of research. Um, <clears throat> um, so, yeah, so as this is a first introduction from our side, perhaps just really just a few words about me. I'm Anne Knapp. I work for the <clears throat> German Academic Exchange Service and the Initiative Research in Germany. And um, yeah, the initiative Research in Germany uh, is um, launched by the and financed by the German Federal Ministry for Research and uh, Education with the aim to inform international scientists about their uh, research opportunities in Germany. So now we talked a lot about us and we're going to get started uh, in just one minute. But before we do so, we would also get to know you a little bit better. And that's why um, I see um, I switch to this poll here. I just uh, realize um, that it's not open. Um, Ravi, can you help me uh, for a second? Um, we need to we need to do something about this. Um, I think it was. Yeah, but anyway, um, I think there were also, I don't know if this uh, was the right poll, but um, actually I would like to start it again um, uh, because it was from yesterday and um, I really would like to get to know the audience of today. Um, so yeah, that's better. <laughs> Sorry for, we had some technical problems today. Um, so as it just, as you probably all know from the um, online events uh, that this can happen, but it, it was important to me um, just to get your uh, feedback from today and to see where the participants today are currently working or what you are working on currently. Um, and it's a little bit different from yesterday because um, our yesterday's webinar was about postdoc opportunities and there we had many, the majority of the participants were from, uh, already ha held a PhD and, and I see here that they are undergraduates um, uh, and the same share of graduates and PhD students and also some people who are in the first phase of their postdoc. So uh, we have information for all of you today, um, but uh, we will focus on, on the PhD and a little bit on the postdoc. And of course, especially on the information that uh, our three professors can give us today. So now we can start uh, what you, with what you're all waiting for with, um, yeah, answering questions. And I think the first question I would like to ask. Um, so um, you, um, dear panelists, are all doing research in Germany as professor, of, of course. Um, so you also also chose Germany in some way. Um, and uh, that's why I would like to ask you, uh, why should other people choose Germany as their research destination or as, as a for a research stay or also a research career in Germany. Um, who would like to answer this question? Um, maybe I can say something mm. because I've just yeah. returned to Germany <laughs> and mm. in right this moment. And I feel that um, at the current time, uh, Germany is 
is such a great place to go because I think a lot of things are changing um, to the better. <laughs> uh, you know, I left 20 years ago and now I've returned. Uh, and I think we're, it's a climate of internationalization, diversity, um, also early career support. I think these are really, really important themes in German academia right now. And there's a lot of funding uh, going into these um, areas um, through these um, third party uh, initiatives of, you know, I'm, I'm working in one. So I think that is, um, it's, yeah, I think right at this moment, Germany is a really good, good place yeah, to go. Thank you for the, yeah. Or to come Thanks. to. Um, yeah. I can definitely support that if uh, if you don't mind. Uh, I think uh, I mean I mean the uh, I mean the sciences, right? Natural sciences, and for me, one of the key issues is that on the one hand, uh, we have well-equipped uh, laboratories, so the funding opportunities in Germany are really good. Uh, there is a lot of opportunities to get funding. Uh, not only from f the federal uh, government, but also from the European uh, Commission. And uh, this this opens us uh, a lot of opportunities also in acquiring um, uh, highly motivated students to do the research in our labs Thank as well. Thank you. Uh, would you like to add something, uh, Professor Erd? Um, most of the things that I would have said are, had already been said. Um, one thing that might be important is we're talking to um, early graduates, I think, mostly. So people looking for a PhD career. And that is quite different in Germany than it is in other countries. Most PhD positions here are employment-based, not as students, at least at my university. And I think it's the same at most other universities. That does not necessarily mean that you're going to get rich working for the university, but it's a different way of pursuing your PhD. And that is something that is a bit special, I think, in many European countries, but it's quite different from the um, American system or the system that is typical in, in Asia, I think. Yeah, and I think this can also be uh, an advantage, right? Because it's, um, yeah. yeah, so it's also one more reason to come to Germany. I mean, we have different Sorry? Yeah, we have different opportunities in Germany. And this is on the one hand that we have this individual um, uh, PhD that you can do uh, under the direct supervision of a professor. Uh, and alternatively, we also have some graduate schools. And the graduate schools is, of course, uh, also a great chance uh, that you work um, much more in a team, team-based with many other students focusing on a similar topic and this exchange among students and even disciplines can be very fruitful to open your scope uh, to to get additional ideas that also supports your own research thank you for, for clarifying this i would like also to mention um that we uh, if you want to know more um, in detail about um, the phd in germany um, we have information about this online, of course, but we also had on Tuesday um, a webinar about PhD opportunities in Germany, and there those aspects are explained in detail, um, and this webinar has been recorded as well as available online. So, um, yeah, I recommend watching it. <laughs> um, it's very interesting as well. So, now I um, had a look at the questions of the particip participants. Um, and there are yeah, many questions about um, the criteria, or most of the questions about, are about the criteria of being accepted for positions. Um, and uh, at the first question, um, I think is especially relevant because uh, it's uh, relevant um, for every career stage that you are in. Um, why uh, professors sometimes don't respond to emails? <laughs> um, I know this. Uh, <laughs> I can uh, uh, part of this because I know that professors are very busy, so uh, that's one of the reasons. Um, uh, yeah. You need to stand out. Um, and I, I think I would like to ask you, dear panelists, um, what makes an email stand out? For you, mm. between others, uh, the answer can be very individual. So I would like to ask all three of you 
this question. Maybe I can I can start here because I have had a couple of mm -hmm. um, emails of people applying for a PhD position with my group, mostly out of the blue. So they just sent me an email and said, "Are there any opportunities available?" And I. I'm, I would say I'm allergic to emails that seem to be bulk emails, and I've received quite a lot of those. And sometimes the people that send those emails don't even bother to correct the institution they're writing to. So I have received emails addressing me by the wrong name. I had emails um, addressing me uh, working at the wrong university. I had emails quoting a paper of myself that has supposedly been read, which was not written by me. These are quite obvious that I don't like to respond to such emails because this seems like the application is being sent out to a lot of people and this is quite annoying. And also, um, it doesn't have to be a full application. If you send me an email, it's, it's not always a good idea to send me a full application with 15 appendices and everything in one email, but rather politely ask if there are any open positions that would warrant apl applying for it. Because you yeah, you put a lot of effort potentially into your CV, into a motivation letter and everything. And if you send an email to me and I know right away I, I don't have any options for you, then this is time wasted on your side preparing things and time wasted on my side having to read everything. So I would start out with sending a polite, rather brief email, not going into too much detail. And then you should likely get an answer, I guess. I have a question directly to this because um, uh, that's that's first of all a good tip, but I would ask myself now, uh, would it be useful, uh, although it's a short email, to explain a bit the, re the field of research or the PhD topic I'm interested in, something like this? <coughs> I mean, otherwise, um, yeah, I don't, perhaps uh, some more information is useful, or don't you look at that in the beginning? And so, of course, I look at this, but the point is people sh applying for a PhD position at my group or my lab should roughly know what we're doing. And if they apply at my lab, they should be interested in what I am doing, so or what is being done here. So it doesn't make sense to apply for a PhD position in, at an institution where we're doing medical robotics and you want to work with a car welding technique, let's say, for example, or doing chemistry or crystallography. I've had all that. So uh, I kind of take that for granted. and. Of course, if there is an open position, an official open position, then you have to apply with everything that you have. But if it's just an unsolicited email that you send to me, um, then it's better if the email is short and I can reply very quickly. And if I can reply, yes, and could be interesting if you say, if you write in your email, I've done a master's degree at this and that university. I have, my specialty is this and that, and I'm looking for a PhD in the field of medical robotics. That helps, of course, but it's, it's by no means mandatory because I would conjecture that you're interested in the stuff of research that we're doing. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No, I mean, for me, that's also uh, just very good to know because I wouldn't have known myself. So um, perhaps, yeah, um, uh, Professor Fink, uh, Professor Hiller, uh, yeah. do you, would you like to start, Professor Hiller, um, with your... I, I, I just want to say mm -hmm. I, I completely agree with this. Um, I also get emails. Um, I try to respond to every email, though, <laughs> I should say. Um, but I get a lot of emails that are not about my field. I should have said that I'm heading uh, our research area, gender intersectionality, at my um, kind of research center. And, um, and I get a lot of emails about gender, you know, in time, place, you know, but, you know, I can only supervise in my field, uh, which is ancient history. Um, I can maybe, you know, um, then, you know, say, you know, maybe you can contact this or that person, um, which I do. Uh, but if it's about me specifically, I would expect that people do a bit of research on on me, on, on my research, on my field, on what I have supervised, what I can supervise, because otherwise it's just a disappointment because yeah, I mean, you have to turn people away. Um, English literature, I can't do, for example, and you know, I get emails about that. Yeah, so yeah. yeah. Thank you. I think that's that's really an important point, um, and we will perhaps uh, explain this a little bit more detailed um, in a few minutes. Um, but I would also like to hear from Professor Fink how how you would like to be approached. Uh, what's your tip? Uh, which ma what makes an email stand out for you? 
I can I can actually under, uh, support what has been said before. There is uh, there is of course one issue that that seems to be important for us in in the field that we are in. Uh, what is the expertise and uh, do you bring the expertise which could be important to us? In order to do that, you definitely have to know what we are doing. What is the field of research that we are in? What is the tools that we are using? What is, let's say, the, the broad topic uh, of research that we that we are doing? And if this and and you may give a few good arguments why you are interested in that that I mean, to come to Germany is a, is a, could be a good reason to broaden your scope of knowledge is also a good uh, a good reason. But um, I mean. It should be somehow outstanding. You see, we 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 get as as was mentioned before, we get a lot of bulk emails, uh, which is not really personal, uh, where people are just asking and expecting a response. So if if it's not not specific enough to what we are interested in, I must not reply, and this is why uh, I cannot reply to to fifty to eighty emails that we are getting yeah, per week. I, I so it must be a good reason for that. I, I think this is um, really understandable if you think about the fact how many emails professors receive. And um, to the participants, perhaps um, something that um, uh, yeah makes it perhaps a little bit more, uh, even more <laughs> understandable. Um, when uh, Because sometimes people also ask me uh, by email how, how can I approach a professor? Um, I've already written 50 uh, to 50 professors, uh, nobody answered. Um, then I think, okay, if you wrote to 50 professors, it probably wasn't really designed uh, for them. So what's, what's really important and what you, uh, the three of you already pointed out is that your, uh, your email fits to that person. And I think the, uh, a lot of work has to be invested before writing to somebody. Um, it has to be invested in finding out um, yeah, which contact or which research area is, uh, or no, not, not research area, but which um, institution or which a chair uh, fits to your interest or, or um, uh, to your expertise. Uh, so finding out where which person to contact the best uh, needs a lot of work before and um, yeah. But that's also an important step. Um, before I um, switch to the next question, I, I was uh, scanning the questions that were coming in here and I saw that there were many uh, subject specific questions, like um, where do I find a scholarship for this research area and or could you please tell me uh, where I can do a master in that research area and um, I I uh, would like to um, ask your understanding uh, for the fact that we will not be able to answer those questions here. Um, my colleagues can post some useful websites where you can look funding options um, up. So the, because the, the answer to those questions are very individual and are usually only relevant for one person, <laughs> for the person that's asking this question. Um, but what we would like to do here is answer questions that are relevant for many more people and that cannot be found um, by a search engine. So uh, I would like, like to kindly ask for your understanding for this. Um, we would like to use the opportunity that we have our three panelists here and um, yeah, but there were uh, of course also many interesting questions and I think I would just um, read um, the next question or is there something that you would like to add to what we said up so far? Um, I'm asking to the panelists. Maybe I, I can add one thing, and uh, and uh, this also relates to the question, how successful is is the first contact to a professor? The uh, uh, in science we have a great international network, and uh, and the network spans over the whole world, and 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 I mean you are. Most of you are, are connected to some professor and your professor may also know some other professors in some other regions of the world. And the best thing and the best support is uh, if your professor 
can give you some advice whom to contact, because these are usually people within their network. And if a network works properly, then the network may also offer opportunities to with the respective person. So ask your professor, which could be the first way to get in touch with other people abroad. And they may also assist you in uh, creating the first contact to the other people abroad. And this, this is, to my impression, the highest success rate that you may achieve. Otherwise, so many, uh, as we discussed before, many uh, direct approaches via email, uh, they fail. And for, for various reasons, we discussed that before, but if you can have already a reasonable support by your professor, uh, it, this is really meaningful. And, uh, and this does not mean that you uh, use a, a letter of support, um, take the advice, or may, you may even ask your professor if he can create the first contact. So this first contact may be the nucleus for further communication. If there is positions available, if there is a specific interest, if you, if uh, the, the the professor abroad um, gets interested in your person because of your competencies and and your your specific expertise, which is for instance missing in the in the research group abroad, and then you you you. <coughs> actually become an important factor, right? And this is what you have to think about. So uh, your professor may be most helpful to you. Thank you. I think this is a useful tip, actually. Um, so um, what makes an email stand out is if it's written also, if it's written by your professor who initiates the first contact, I mean, of course, this also makes it stand out. But um, just because I also don't want to um, still want to encourage uh, people to get active um, or to be active and um, try to apply uh, different ways. So would it also be possible to um, accept uh, an email that was written by a person without the professor, but that was yeah fitting for you? That's still possible, right? So. Um, it's possible to contact professors by email. We can encourage them if they consider the things you said before, right? So I just want to mention this again, and I'm, I'm happy that you're nodding because um, there are, of course, many different ways. But like you said, the context that people have, um, yeah, are also very useful. So very good to point this out. Um, yeah, having a look at the questions, there were some uh, yeah questions that perhaps uh, can be answered quickly. Uh, the next question, at least, um, and it fits to what we were talking about just right now. Um, because it's about personal contact. So somebody was asking, is it possible to meet professors in person if one is in the area? How do you, the three of you, uh, deal with this? <laughs> um, might be different also from person to person. Um, um, how can somebody meet? Yeah, I'm well, sorry. I think, I, uh, yeah, what I, what I wanted to um, say about where I think it, it speaks to that is that there are a lot of events in universities, even online events now, lot of, lots of them. So to get to know a research area and uh, a research group, um, you might actually want to you know, check out, you know, what's going on and um, and participate in a few of the activities. In my research center, I mean, we have, you know, too much, uh, but a lot of it is online or if you're in the area, come along and then you can actually also meet in person around uh, an event, uh, which usually works better, you know, and because, you know, the professors might be there anyway, you know, and they kind of take the time um, and so on, and you can participate in the discussion and you show that you're actually interested and engaged um, with um, with what's going on in the field. So I think that it's, that's a really um, useful thing to do. So I would, you know, but it kind of comes back to this um, topic of doing some research mm. on you know what's actually going on in in the university you want you want to join and you know and and the community the research community uh, you want to join i would Thank agree it's, it's difficult to to get an individual appointment i would say if you're just a student from a different university so it would be tricky but meeting us at events or maybe at scientific conferences would also be a possibility 
we didn't go to many scientific conferences in the past years, obviously, but in the future I hope to uh, take that up again, so that would also be an option. And those conferences often have very discounted rates for, for students, so you could go there in person and have the chance to meet many professors from a related field, so that might be interesting as well. Yeah, that's actually a great recommendation and um, sometimes these conferences, as, as you said, are online so it's even more accessible than yeah. it was before. So that's really an advantage now. Um, Professor Fink, uh, is there anything else you would like to add? No, I, I, I think a, a first personal contact is, could be really helpful because then, uh, then both sides get a, get a first impression. Uh, and, uh, and in particular, this first contact, which is not a written uh, email, but let's say mm. uh, people talk to each other, one also gets uh, a kind of feeling if the, uh, if let's say language knowledge is matches, right? So mm. sometimes we, uh, we, we get superior emails written in perfect English. And then if we try to, to talk to the people, things, may become really difficult, right? So this personal one-to-one -one contact uh, is really, impor really important. And uh, I would definitely uh, agree with the two other panelists uh, that conferences is, is really a good chance. And for some conferences, of course, even if it is online conferences, you, you may not get access to the, to the conference. But uh, if we go back to normal conference, conferences in presence, which may even take place in your university, just uh, drop by, try to get in touch with the people. So to ask someone, it's, it's never a big issue. Okay, thanks. Right? Yeah, I, I hope that's encouraging uh, because I also, it sounds like a good opportunity to, to try the personal contract or to, to, to try to get into personal contact at conferences or other opportunities, other events. Um, so, um, there were also questions, of course, um, concerning um, PhD positions, um, and one of them uh, was um, how important, oh, I have to, sorry, um, it's a bit, um, it's about, um, yeah, research background. So, uh, I would like to know if, um, for to apply for a doctorate in Germany, it's necessary to have extensive research experience. Um, perhaps you could also um, shortly, um, the three of you answered from your point of view, how important research experience is for somebody who wants to start with a PhD, who is applying for a PhD. I mean, our students also then uh, have only have limited research experience. So they do their master degree or their master thesis based on a, on a six months research work usually. Uh, so this is not really extensive, right? So the, the research background always is limited. And, uh, and so what I, what I know from, from China, uh, when Chinese students do their master thesis, they are usually much longer in the research group. So they do a lot of uh, uh, research by training. And the, usually the, the training period is much, much longer compared to, uh, to German universities. So in, in that respect, you do not have any any uh, drawback with uh, with uh, with the amount of research that you have done so far. What I what I actually and this is what I have to admit. What I do not really like if students uh, write about their competences. If they write what kind of uh, analytical tools they they can use, and they, in the end it turns out they never. They, they have seen the instrument, but they have never operated an instrument. This is not, this is not expertise, right? The, the expertise that you have to demonstrate is where you are really safe to use a specific technique. Otherwise, this is not an expertise. You got some data. In most cases, you took the data for your thesis to support the other data that you obtained by yourself, uh, but, but be aware that at one point, the, that your future supervisor 
may also ask you and ask for details. And this is what I usually do. And then I figure out what is missing and what is the real competence. Yeah, I would agree. Maybe one thing that, yeah, yeah, for... maybe one thing that I could add is um, what I have seen sometimes is that people apply and say, I have this and that publication planned for submission. I don't like that either. Uh, it's, it's okay if you have something that is under review and you put that in your application that you have something somewhere under review, but planned is not something you should brag about. Um, and also, if you have actual publications that will already, as, a, as a, someone who has just finished his or her master's degree, that will already separate you from the pack, you could say. So that's not something that is the, the rule. It's more the exception than the rule, I would say. Okay, but on the other hand, planned, couldn't it just mean I'm interested in this topic? Uh, it depends. I, I was just thinking about a specific application yeah. where someone wrote, no. I have the publication with this title planned for submission with this conference or this, this, paper, uh, this, this journal. Um, that sounds a bit like, uh, yeah, over yeah, and over, okay. a bit of an overreach, mm. I think. Yeah, okay, I understand. Thanks. Mm. Yeah. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect publications or that kind of research experience to start a PhD. Um, I think in the humanities, uh, you know, publications take a really long time as well. And the most important publication uh, that you should get out of your PhD is the PhD, which has to be published in Germany. And um, yeah, and it should be, you know, the, 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 the main focus of, of this research. Uh, so I think that is, that is quite important to remember, um, you know, rather than a lot of small publications, that's not really what I'm looking okay. for. Yeah, thank you. Maybe this is a, this is a real Chinese issue, right? So the, the issue in China is uh, before the students can graduate to their master degree, they have to publish the result from their master thesis. Otherwise, they won't get the degree. And this is why, why Chinese students always have to somehow come up with a publication. That's actually the background. And this is why sometimes the idea, we plan this publication, this is actually mm -hmm. the background for, yes, we, I have to do it and I, okay. I will have to do it. So it shows, it shows in some way what your research area is actually. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, but. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's always a question. You see, if, if, if someone states uh, he has a publication and it's, it's, uh, he or she is the co-author in the, in the third or fourth position, then it's not okay. his or her publication. They mm -hmm. contribute it, but they are not the main author. So the main, the, the, it's actually the, the first and second author when they are shared authors, this is what really counts, at least in the science. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I think that is uh, are interesting insights for the participants. Um, and uh, I, before I uh, skip to the next question, um, I, I would like to perhaps answer some questions that are very um, in the head uh, that perhaps I can just answer quickly um, uh, because it would clarify some things uh, for the participants. So I think something that's important to know is um, that uh, in in Germany, at least, I think also in other countries, it's like this. Um, there are, on the one hand, sometimes announcements for open positions, also PhD positions, but also postdoc positions. And usually, um, you can, of course, correct me if it's wrong, um, those open positions define which the, the, the research that will be carried out, and you will apply for that topic. Um, and if you apply individually, and um, say, I would like to do a PhD or postdoc, and, and this is what I want to do, and I want to do research about this topic, um, it's also apply, possible to apply individually. Mostly in those cases, the positions are not paid. If you, if you find a host, it will not be paid, and in that case, you would need to apply for funding, additional funding. Um, so I just wanted to point out that it can be the one way, there is a topic, and you can just say I would like to do that topic um, that you uh, proposed <laughs> or I have my own topic but then usually you have to look for funding. Um, yeah and I just wanted to explain this because I don't know if it's ob obvious for everybody. Uh, 
Professor Hilner, you would like to say something about Yeah, well, I think it's, it's uh, yeah. discipline specific as well, because I think uh, the natural sciences work a little bit differently uh, than the humanities. I think in the humanities, um, every PhD project is mainly a, a standalone project. Um, so you're not you're not necessarily working in a team on a you know just on a small aspect of a of a bigger bigger um, yeah uh, bigger research question. I think these collaborative uh, initiatives in the humanities, like my own, you know, beyond slavery and freedom, um, they are really really wide and and um, and up to interpretation. So I think what also happens in the humanities is that if you have your project and you're looking for kind of an individual um, supervision, um, you can still um, you know try to kind of um, associate it with one of these bigger research themes because it's just another perspective of looking at your topic, um, you know, and, and and reinterpreting it or you know or gaining a new um, kind of angle on it. Um, through, uh, you know, kind of figuring out how it might actually relate to these bigger topics. Um, so I think that is, that is a little different than, you know, in, in the natural sciences, which kind of by definition are mm -hmm. a bit more precise, um, I, would, I would think, uh, but maybe my colleagues can, can say more about that. Would you like to say yeah, more maybe about Maybe a that? little bit. Uh, Professor Ernst, Professor my, my research <laughs> quite often makes use of expensive machinery robots, x-ray machines, ultrasonic imaging, tracking devices, cameras, whatever, you name it. And that automatically mandates that things kind of go together. So it's, it's impractical for us to buy machinery that costs in excess of, of 50 or 100,000 euros for each individual PhD student. So that wouldn't work. So that I, by design limits the, the area of topics that we can successfully work on. And of course there are also purely theoretical topics even in, in robotics and medical robotics, but this is relatively rare. And that kind of leads to the situation that you are not really free to choose the topic because it has to fit with the profile of the institution you're, you're looking for. And I guess it's similar with, with many of the natural sciences. Um, and that also means that if you have an idea which you want to pursue in a PhD, you really have to think hard which institution with which technological background will be able to support that kind of idea. And just for, for a funding perspective, I'm currently supervising 12 PhD students and nine or no, 10 of them are on working on specific projects they applied for, so not their own idea. And only two of them had their own idea, and this is only because this is money that comes from the state and is not fixed to a specific topic. And this is probably the, the typical relationship in the engineering sciences. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Um, I mean, this also relates to the, to the fact that some students come up with a, with a research proposal. Right, the research proposal is uh, is not really important to get uh, to get the position at the university abroad. Right, this is what has been said before. We get we get funding for specific projects, and we have to work on the specific projects because we have uh, work work some kind of working plan uh, to come up to some results, which which then. Uh, uh, resumes the, uh, the the project so this is uh, you 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 should be able to work under with the, with the professor's ideas and to, to get uh, promoted by uh, coming up with let's say uh, creative ideas to to come to a to a final conclusion for the project this is what what uh, what will be important. Okay, thank you. Um, I really see that the time is running. We still haven't talked about uh, postdoc positions, um, but um, I think that's okay. We, uh, we perhaps uh, one or two questions about postdocs will be possible. But uh, the majority of our participants uh, were interested in PhD positions, also uh, mentioned in the reg registration. So um, I still will ask one more PhD question. Um, Perhaps it's possible to answer this um, shortly um, because we only have 15 minutes left. So I think this is also an interesting question here. Um, if I do not have enough knowledge um, of necessary tools, for example, 
experimental methodology, statistical software, would you recommend that I learn about them through the courses, so before applying, or would it be enough just to show my proposal, my willingness to learn during the PhD journey? <laughs> Most important is your motivation and not your, uh, so nobody is perfect, right, is uh, one of the sayings, and uh, we do not uh, we do not expect to have the perfect student uh, to, who already knows everything. So the, to do a PhD is a kind of training, uh, and during this training period you will also learn and will have the opportunity to learn uh, new techniques, and there usually is plenty of time also to focus on new things, and this is, uh, this is what is important for you, right? So the, if, you, if you invest time even if you don't know if it will be successful, so this is wasted time. So better go there to try to, to, to approach uh, the professors directly and try okay. try your luck, right? And uh, and then everything uh -huh. works. I, I think that makes this answer makes the participants <laughs> happy. <laughs> um, but could, can the others uh, to agree to to that yeah. um, answer? Would you agree? Well, I, uh, I think it depends. I think some skills you really have to have. So in my field, which is ancient history, if you don't have Latin and Greek, okay, yeah. it's, I mean, people do approach me without, yeah. you know, and say, well, I don't have Latin and Greek. And, you know, it was just well, it was so time consuming, um, you know, or, but then other languages, you know, that you need modern languages, you might you know, be able to just, you know, study while you're doing a PhD. But I think very important is also that um, time set, time sensitive uh, PhD programs. So if you have to finish in four years, three years, four years, um, there is just, you know, not enough time to also then learn Greek uh, if you need it also for doing your research. So I think that is, that is quite important um, in terms of, yeah, looking a little bit of, you know, when you will have to finish and what you can. You I know, would agree. Package. Similarly, I would expect people to work with robots to have some basic idea about the mathematics necessary for doing so. So that would be a given. And also the, the question said, my willingness to learn during the PhD journey, that should be a given. If you want to do a PhD, then of course you should be willing and eager to learn because it's, it's, it's about learning and, and doing research and finding out new things. And it's not about just doing things you already know. So it's quite important. I think um, difficult perhaps, um, or what people are asking themselves perhaps now is how can I prove my willingness? And um, here I would like to come back to what we said before. I think perhaps you can just nod if it's correct. Um, a good way of not showing your willingness is really uh, picking an institution or chair, professor that is a perfect match for your research background and really showing you, you just fit to each other, your research background fits to each other very good and you've already worked in that direction or showed can show that you know what what's need to be done needs to be done so um, that you just know what you're applying for also you said that before but I wanted to mention it again because it's so important and there was also a question in the chat um, again about that um, what uh, we can recommend um, to somebody if, if this person get doesn't get an answer so yeah I just wanted to I don't want to go too much into detail, only if I said something incorrect, <laughs> you can of course uh, correct me now, but um, otherwise I would like to go to the next question because we only have seven minutes left. Um, short question again. Um, is it possible to be co-supervised by two professors for a PhD? How common is this? Yes. Okay. It's possible. Yeah. Yeah. Why not? Uh, that's a that's upon agreement of yeah. the professors, yeah. right? So if, if in, in particular when it's interdisciplinary, right? And we do a lot of interdisciplinary research. Then you take two experts, and the two two experts may actually promote uh, the final result. Very not yeah, uncommon, I, I would say. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Short question, short, short answer. Um, I think here's one more interesting uh, PhD uh, question and then I will, will skip um, to a few minutes for the postdocs. Um, so as a non-EU citizen, I require a special visa to do a PhD in Germany. Should I mention this to a professor when I ask about them about available positions? 
Or is it something that I would just discuss with the managers? You should definitely mention it. <laughs> Non-EU doesn't matter. I, th I think you should... But perhaps Professor... Non-EU doesn't matter. <laughs> <Sorry. Sorry. laughs> I just said Professor Ernst, he was Sorry. a... Uh, very brief answer. answer. Really you should mention it because it, it, <laughs> yeah. it, it's important to know when you could start because that will relate it. But I personally don't deal with this. And, it's, and you will, if you have an offer for a PhD scholarship position that covers your living expenses, then you will get the required visa. Somehow. So, Professor Fink, right. what do you... Usually it's not an it's not an issue. So we usually have the issues if uh, for the for the graduate students uh, going into the master degree programs, in particular from uh, from very specific countries. So we now learn that uh, for some of the students they they have appointments for the visa interview in November, right? Even if they got the admission. Uh, for the study program uh, three or four months ago. Okay, thank you for, for the quick answer. Um, uh, then I would skip to the next question. Um, so the postdoc, the promised uh, postdoc question. Um, so, okay, I hope it's not too complicated to answer it in, in a few minutes. So um, what are the criteria um, and proposal requirements if I apply for postdoc position at a German university? I think, of course, that differs, <laughs> but is it possible to summarize or perhaps to mention the most important facts? Um, and this is a question I would like to ask all three of you. Uh -huh. or, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I think it very much depends yeah, on the discipline, yeah. right? There's, there's, there's a few things that, that become, an, become important. So one of the major criteria for the postdocs, because this is usually the positions which are more expensive, uh, is the question of financing the postdoc period. Uh, there is, of course, also programs, federal programs, and also DAD may assist in some, uh, at least in, with respect to answer some potential funding questions. Um, the, uh, I think the. the pretty much the same as for the PhD student. So it has to somehow match the research interests between the group, the potential supervisor, uh, the activity in the group, and again, the, the, the professors also have to, have to get an idea that they also profit from um, the, the, the PhD, uh, from, for, from the postdoc student, right? So this is, this is, uh, so uh, a matter of uh, giving and earning, right? This uh, this becomes more and more important the the more promoted the students are. Okay, thank you. Um, is, uh, would you agree? I think in the humanities it's oddly, yeah, it's oddly a bit the. I think it's the other way around. So. Um, the PhD project is often very standalone, you know, a student's own project, you know, with the research proposal and device and so on. While a lot of postdoc uh, positions are actually project based. So you actually have to work for a professor, um, which I think in the, in the natural sciences, you know, happens at PhD level already. And I, I think a lot of people find that quite a difficult transition because they come from a relative autonomy uh, to a much more kind of employment uh, status where they have to work on a project and deliver results. Um, and I think this is something to, to think about, um, particularly with these project-based postdocs. There are obviously also other postdocs in the humanities, um, like, um, uh, well, the, the kind of postdocs that are attached to chairs, uh, where there's a lot of teaching uh, involved. So, um, yeah, so I think that's another another aspect uh, that is important, you know, willingness to teach, teaching experience um, as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, re really interesting, the, those differences um, between the research areas. So, um, Professor Ernst, how is it in the interview? I think I can probably go with what uh, my colleague Rainer Fink said. It's mostly the same here. Maybe one thing to add, I would expect a postdoc to help in supervising the PhD students give them advice and support them in their research work because it's kind of a, a teaching by peers in a way. You you just completed or recently completed your PhD thesis, then you should be able to guide others and help them with problems that you already faced. Um, and yeah, similarly to what Rainer thinks that it's, it's more about the money than with the 
uh, PhD students because their postdoc positions are more expensive. People are expect are expecting a, a full time a full term position where they can live from the money they make, maybe even sustain a family. So it's it's more difficult, I get I guess, to to obtain a postdoc position um, than a PhD position. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's um, really, um, I think, also interesting to have an answer to these questions from, from somebody who thinks about these um, financial fi financing postdoc. I think uh, that's also helpful if um, somebody who applies puts him or herself in, in those shoes about somebody who has yeah, decided to decide about or organize those facts. Um, okay, it's five to three in Germany, uh, but uh, I think we can perhaps ask because there's so many interesting questions in the chat and of course I wasn't able to answer or ask you all of them. Um, perhaps last short question um, from somebody about research assistance. Um, would it be possible to, or do so based on your experiences uh, and the people you know, do many professors make use of research assistance? Would it be possible to contact a professor um, yeah, for, for such a position? Or is this something that's not common in Germany? I mean, this, this I could mean, be... I have... A, a professor, no, no, you go on. You the first no, 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 no. you first. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, just, I, I have research assistants uh, in terms of student assistants, uh, but those are mostly okay. BA or MA students. Um, so I think this is, you know, a very, very German thing um, that you, you know, you, you give assistance to a professor while, while you're still studying. Um, but I don't know whether that is the position that is being referred to here. Mm -hmm. Professor Fink, sorry, I interrupted you. Now, when, 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 we, when we talk about research assistant, this is basically on the postdoc level. Uh, and uh, as was mentioned before, research assistants uh, not only do research, they will also have some duties in, uh, in education and on the, on the MSP and PSC degree programs. So th and this is what, what we actually um, uh, consider. However, what we should of course claim, uh, there is many other research institutions in Germany uh, beyond the universities. So the, uh, the universities on the first hand is, let's say, doing education uh, primarily and uh, research second. But there is a lot of other research institutions that where, where let's say, they, where they basically focus on the research only. So for instance, Max Planck Society, uh, Fraunhofer Society, uh, Helmholtz Institutes, um, they are, this is, let's say, the, uh, the, the research, the big research institutes beyond university, right? And, and their, let's say, postdoc and research assistants, they are much closer and only focusing on yeah, research. That's, that's important to say because we haven't been able to touch uh, this topic yet. Um, and now the time is running up. Um, but uh, I can uh, say that we had a webinar also on Monday about um, the German research landscape. Um, so th there you can get a very deep insight into how it's organized in Germany. <laughs> um, also, um, I want to recommend um, checking the website German Research Explorer, no, German Research Institutions. My colleague Gabi can post this in the chat. By the way, thanks Gabi for the support uh, and the organization um, in the chat. Um, so uh, yeah, but that was important to point out um, and via the research institutions database, you can, for example, ease, more easy find um, where in Germany your kind of research is carried out. But now uh, we I think we will need a, little, a few more minutes then uh, after three o'clock. Um, and I would like to, yeah, to close this webinar now um, by first saying thank you again to, to the panelists and the participants. Thanks a lot for your interest. Um, as a last question, I would like to ask all panelists for their take home message. And now I really would like to start with Professor Fink, then Professor Ernst, and then Professor Hilner for your take home message. <laughs> so Professor Fink, it's your turn. Yeah. Take home, the take home message for the, for the students uh, attending this, uh, this meeting. I think uh, um, the most important thing, be open 
uh, to become to become international. So to go to a foreign institution will definitely promote your personality. You will uh, you will return as a different person. You you are uh, socialized maybe in a very different way compared to what you what you learned in China. So Germany is a very different country to uh, compare to China. So you try it out, just test. Welcome to Germany. Thanks, Thanks for these motivating words. Uh, then I would like to hand over to Professor Ernst. Yeah, I would like to say a take home message would be to be honest with yourself and with the people you're talking to if you're looking for an option to work in Germany. Don't exaggerate in your emails. Be honest about what you can and what you cannot do. And that will that that is something that I can most of the time read out from a from a text whether a person is trying to exaggerate or not. And if you if you're really honest and if you're really open, that will help you gain trust with the people you're talking to and trying to secure a position and that should be something you should strive for. And as as Professor Fink said, it's really a great opportunity to leave your country and go for scientific work somewhere else. So I can only encourage that. Thank you so much. Uh, and um, I would like to hand over to uh, Professor Hilner. What is your take home message? Take home message? Um, I think uh, something that brings together uh, quite a few things that we have said that, you know, if so research is not kind of a lonely um, endeavor. You know, you are joining a community uh, when you're, you know, going to, you know, a foreign um, institution, you know, institution in, in Germany. Um, it's not just about the relationship with the professor, even though <laughs> we're now here as representatives. Uh, but, you know, it is good to do this kind of research that we've been talking about, you know, about the environment, the research environment, also the larger networks uh, that professors are embedded in, how they might connect to networks at your own home institution right now. Um, so yeah, think about um, yeah the, the the dialogue and the dynamics uh, of of research and 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 yeah and the interactions between people. Um, is, I think, really important. Thank you so much also for your take-home message. Um, I also have a very short uh, message, um, take-home message for the participants. Um, just, um, I already mentioned um, the recordings of the other webinars, but uh, we have a lot more information available online for you. Um, you can also contact us at Research in Germany. Um, we are happy to answer your questions. Um, and yeah, uh, so there is a lot of information available. Um, Germany is interested in international researchers and there are a lot of opportunities, although it's uh, of course also compet competitive, but um, we are welcoming you and uh, yeah, looking forward to contacting us. Um, so um, yeah, with these words, I would say like to say goodbye to the participants and to the panelists. So. Thank, thanks again. Um, and uh, dear participants, don't leave us uh, because uh, I will now skip to the next slide. Um, yeah, but first of all, goodbye everyone and we see each other at the next webinar. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.